Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Facebook Live as we discuss the state of Black mental health, coping and healing in the midst of trauma. My name is Dr. Earl Turner. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the founder and executive director of Therapy for Black Kids. Therapy for Black Kids is an organization founded to promote healthy development among Black youth. Our mission is to provide resources to parents to help them raise healthy kids in the 21st century. In addition to my work with Therapy for Black Kids, I am also a clinical child psychologist and the past president of the Society for Child and Family Policy and Practice. Before I turn it over to our moderator, I wanted to provide a brief um, introduction. And as you're joining, please um, let us know where you are watching from today. Um, and so let me introduce our moderator, Dr. Uh, Donnell Barnett. He is a counseling psychologist with a personal mission of improving communities. As an Af Iraq and Afghanistan combat veteran, he was an active duty army officer rising from an enlistment man to the rank of major. He currently serves in the US Army Reserves. Some of his previous assignments include director of HIV prevention programs, adjunct professor of psychology, behavioral health clinic director, and chief of field investigations and program evaluation for the US Army Public Health Center. Dr. Barnett now serves as a deputy director for mental health clinical operations at the Illinois Department of Human Services. He has published works in scholarly and popular press outlets, as well as co-authored and authored technical reports, policy papers, and presented at national conferences. Dr. Barnett is a member of the American Psychological Association and president-elect of the Association of Black Psychologists. His research and practice areas include system levels, programs to improve the health and well-being of communities, in particular those left out of economic and social growth. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Barnett um, to moderate the session. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you so much. I am really excited about this topic today. Really excited to see the brilliance of the scholars who will participate and contribute to this conversation. Um, as uh, And Dr. Turner, thank you so much for that very warm introduction. Um, uh, again, I'm Donnell Barnett, and I'm proud to represent the Association of Black Psychologists, the only independent ethnic minority psychological association in the country. And I, we, we just thank you all so much for, thank you, Dr. Turner, for bringing uh, this group of scholars and researchers and, and passionate people together to really highlight this topic. Uh, before we start, I wanted to kind of uh, give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. We have a fantastic um, uh, group of people who will help us, help us understand this topic and really kind of engage. Uh, and so, you know, Dr. Jernigan and Dr. Metzger, Metzger, if you would, please come on and tell us a little bit about you. We'll start with Dr. Merriam. Hi, so I'm Dr. Miriam jernigan Oessi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a licensed psychologist, a counseling psychologist by training. I am also a professor of psychology. So I'm located in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, do teach um, as an assistant professor at Agnes Scott College um, and also am the director of the Intersections uh, Psychology Research Lab, where uh, we look at the racial health, mental health and physical health disparities of individuals with a particular emphasis uh, on black girls and women and also the examination of experiences of racial discrimination, in other words, racial trauma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Metzger. Good evening and thank you for having me today. I am coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Georgia where I am in the clinical psychology program. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I'm certified in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. I currently supervise and teach around helping to heal from racial trauma and racial stressors. Uh, my research interests are around racial socialization and racial identity and how we can use family practices and family processes to help 
uh, Black youth in particular cope with their experiences of racial stressors? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Dr. Turner will be coming back in. You want to tell us a little bit more about yourself personally, Dr. Turner? Sure. So I, I gave a brief introduction earlier to let you all know that I'm the founder and executive director of Therapy for Black Kids. I'm also a assistant professor of psychology here in Los Angeles, California, um, as well as being a licensed psychologist. And I teach um, classes at Pepperdine uh, University. And I'm also um, my research area focuses in on looking at race based stress, um, as well as mental health disparities among the black community. Excellent, excellent. I just want to take now that everyone is on the screen, I just want to take in this black brilliance that's happening right now and just bask in that right for a moment. Um, we, we're going to have an exciting and engaging conversation today about a very, very critically important topic that a lot of people are thinking about, they're wondering about, and really looking for some uh, professional and familial assistance, right? You know, we're kin in that sense. And so we, uh, we're excited to have this brilliance with us. Um, just to highlight a few housekeeping things as we pro progress through the conversation, uh, this Facebook Live will be saved on the page. And so you can go back, review it later on. If you need to kind of go and take a little bit and kind of process and then come back to it, it'll be available for you. Feel free to uh, write your comments in the chat. That'll give us an opportunity to kind of see what you're thinking about. You can pose questions in the chat and we'll definitely try to accommodate and address all the questions and comments that come up as well. So again, thank you so much. And we're going to jump right in. Since this panel is focused on the state of black mental health, Let's start with what do you say? What do you see as the common or the the mental health challenges that Black folks are facing right now? And I'll, I'll give the question to uh, Dr. Mary. If you would kind of start us off with setting the setting the stage for what are we facing today? Sure. There's actually a few trends um, that I've been following regarding the state of Black mental health currently. Um, so certainly, I know that today we plan to talk a little bit about racial trauma, but that you know is, is first and foremost in my mind with regard to just the response um, to continued exposure, uh, in many cases nationally, right? National examples of racial violence, discrimination and racism that are impacting the black um, community. They're certainly not new to the black community, but again, that continued exposure has been significant. And there's some studies um, that have indicated that amid the COVID pandemic, um, it can be seen and understood you know, as even more uh, complex for, for individuals. But as I kind of break down and begin to look at the black community, there's actually some interesting studies that have also focused, you know, from a from a gender perspective, have looked at the experiences, for example, of black women um, who are reporting increased rates of cumulative stress, right, based on a variety of factors in their lives, which is impacting both their mental health and physical health. Uh, and certainly as we have the conversation about the black community relative to COVID. So some of the more public health or health related conversations also need to include mental health um, because the implications for blacks in the United States, right, relative to COVID have highlighted some of the medical, uh, the ways in which the, the medical aspects are disproportionately impacting certainly black and brown communities, but the black community in particular, this has also been to the detriment, unfortunately, of mental health. With, you know, one study reporting that approximately 59% of Blacks who had been surveyed recently reported also experiencing both increased stress and also feeling more um, anxiety, so feeling much more anxious about a variety of things. We could certainly think about the impact of the staggering amount of job loss or underemployment due to the pandemic, um, the loss, therefore, subsequently with regard to health insurance or financial stability, food insecurity, um, housing, for example, and, and and you know, relative to some of the the medical data, thinking about experiences of grief, grief and loss, um, as well as concerns about the impact of COVID, sometimes referred to as morbidity and mortality. Uh, all of these experiences, if we think about the impact on, it, on individuals, are going to, in some cases, maybe exacerbate pre-existing mental health concerns and physical health con um, conditions. The other, um, as I look across the lifespan right, of the Black community, uh, one of the other trends, I would say, in terms of just research and 
stories that I continue to see evolve is regarding the increased rates of suicide amongst Black youth in particular. Now, some of this data emerged prior to COVID, but there are some more recent studies that have talked about the fact that suicide rates amongst um, Black youth in particular have increased. They increased for all youth um, since about 2007 to 2018. But when we begin to disaggregate the data with regard to race and gender, we are seeing Black girls in particular really um, have a significant increase with regard to suicide attempt and completion. Um, in some reports, Black girls ages 13 to 19, um, those rates included 182 percent increase uh, with regard to suicide death rates from about um, 2001 to 2017. And that has continued to increase amongst um, the, the amid the, the pandemic. Some of that information, you know, as we continue to understand, ties back to you know, our conversation with regard to the impact of racism and racial discrimination and the toll that it is also having on youth. And I'll, I'll just sort of end with just thinking about, again, the, just the overall impact of the pandemic on the Black community. So as we think about you know, uh, the roles that Black folks hold with regard to employment, whether they're teachers or whether they are essential workers, and really begin to unpack the narratives there. Certainly we have black teachers that are reporting that they're navigating uh, the experience of the pandemic as teachers and all the stress that we've heard about, but they're also finding themselves, you know, among colleagues in school districts and schools where there may be some attempts to, to look at racial equity and feeling burdened with the responsibility and sometimes explicitly so by their colleagues or districts to assist with understanding race related dynamics, um, which is taking a toll. Um, and as we think about, again, the experience of those folks who have been working through the pandemic, um, certainly thinking about their exposure, uh, both in healthcare facilities, other types of jobs. We often talk about our nurses and doctors, but it is so the case that many Black identifying individuals may work in positions in health facilities where they're responsible for the safety and maintenance, right? So they too are witnessing and have witnessed um, the pandemic unfold, they're witnessing loss of life, et cetera. So as we think about um, the implications of that from a post-traumatic stress um, perspective, I think that that's um, something else that we need to continue to pay attention to. So I, I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop there in terms of just, those are some of the highlights that I see really informing the current state of mental health uh, concerns uh, that Black folks are, are identifying and dealing with. As you talk about it, I think about it, what I see in my mind is a multiple front um, issue that people are trying to contend with as different members of the family, you know, just general, general black folks, some women specific kinds of things, some children specific kinds of things, the family specific kinds of things. And then you extend it out into healthcare education, right? You know, the systems that support just a multiple front target that people are contending with. Um, we certainly have had some seminal issues uh, uh, over, or seminal events over the last year. Uh, we recently sort of um, uh, g went through uh, the, the year uh, anniversary of the killing of George Floyd. How do you, uh, Dr. Turner, and I'll, I'll put this to you, how do you think that this, you know, that particular issue has impacted families, Black families, Absolutely. Well, I want to. I want to. I'm going to answer that question, but I want to briefly go back to um, the first question about the state of Black mental health, um, and really speaking to the the lack of seeking out mental health treatment. Because I think, given all of the concerns that Dr. Marion mentioned, is that we are experiencing all of these potential stressors, and then the data is showing that that we're less than 50 percent um, likely to actually seek out care. So we know that people are continuing to struggle with these difficulties without being able to get the assistance that they need to be able to sort of improve their overall wellness. And that does have, you know, some, some health um, implications as well, um, as Dr. Uh, Maria mentioned. Um, in terms of the sort of the stress and, and, and coping with the challenges of continued police brutality and the killings of, of Black people, I think this recent sort of anniversary of, of the killing of George Floyd has allowed many of us to sort of reflect on how much change has occurred when it comes to this particular issue from a systemic level. Um, and we've seen that there have been continued incidents. I think the last numbers that I saw was that at this point, there have been um, about 900 
killings of, of people um, by police in, in the in the last uh, since this year. Not all of those are, are black people, but we've definitely seen that even since the trial that there have been recent incidents uh, of other black people killed by by police. And so I think those types of experiences continue to make us sort of have high stress and alert around our interactions with police. And that adds to the difficulties that we have in terms of coping with general stress in terms of just the pandemic and just life. And so I think those types of things we have to be mindful of and really make sure that we are intentional about being able to maintain some sense of joy when the world continues to sort of attack us and, and, and harm us in so many ways. Thank you. You, you, you brought up something and, and uh, just to kind of deviate just a little bit, this issue of engaging therapy. And I, I think the, the statistic you quoted was 50 percent. Um, I'm curious, do is there something different about healing and help seeking and therapy that you have observed that's unique to the culture? Yeah, and then I'll, I'll sort of leave that open. Yeah, uh, I'll add, and then uh, any of the others, Dr. Mexico, Dr. Mira, you can join in. Um, I think one of the challenges is that from a um, standpoint of diversity within the profession, that we know that it's less than less than 2% of psychologists that identify as Black. And so for us, oftentimes it is more comfortable to talk with someone that looks like us. And I think for many people, especially given some of the, the, the things that have happened over the last year, um, has made them be more reluctant to seek out care because of the inability to find a therapist that, that also identifies as Black. Yeah, I'll, I, I, I was just, I'll add to that, and I think I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and, and one thing that I want folks to take into consideration as we think about you know, the statistic with regard to being able to, you know, seeking, right, and how we really understand that. I agree with Dr. Earl that for many in, in my both private practice as well as just experience as a practitioner and working with um, Black clients, it is more about the challenges of feeling as though, uh, I, I definitely think that there may be some historical um, uh, you know, stigma associated, as some folks will talk about stigma with regard to mental health treatment in the Black community. I think we need to expand that conversation and reframe it because um, I'm seeing increased interest, but as Dr. Earl you know, indicated, there are disparities with regard to certainly thinking about the number of therapists of color. And for other folks, even in the absence of having a therapist of color, the notion of being able to work with a therapist that has, you know, that, that utilizes a, a lens that incorporates and integrates race, right, as an important factor in the lives of black individuals. So what we refer to sometimes as, you know, culturally responsive um, clinicians. And for many of the clients that I've worked with that have sought working with a therapist of color, it's at least the hope, right? That if I'm working with a therapist of color, they understand the importance, the significance, the way in which race shows up in my life and how that factors into my presenting concerns. And there is, I think that the field still has some work to do in that regard. So as I think about access, I also think about access to appropriate, um, you know, therapeutic services that are truly going to be beneficial for, for black identifying individuals. And we still, as I mentioned, have some work to do there and that impacts right? Folks ability to access services. It's, uh, you know, in my mind, I see we talked about multiple um, uh, challenges that folks are facing and a diminished number of resources that's available to mitigate those things. It's a very uh, precarious situation. Uh, Dr. Metzger, we talked a little bit about uh, racial trauma that has come up in the conversation so far. Uh, level set for us a little bit about what what do we mean? What does that mean? What is racial trauma? Help us define it. Give us some context for it. Yes, I do want to contribute to um, some thoughts that we've been sharing about our help seeking behaviors as well. And I think that um, I'll probably integrate that in my answer to your question about what is racial trauma. Um, so what I'll say is that racial trauma is a fairly new construct, but it's not research that is new. So we do know based on um, longstanding research by our forefathers, so people like Robert Carter, um, 
people like Janet Helms, people who have been doing this work like Enrique Neblet to really establish the mental, the behavioral, and even the physical consequences of experiencing racial stressors. Um, so racial trauma is our emerging conceptualization or understanding of what that can look like. And Dr. Jernigan started talking about some of the symptoms earlier that include hypervigilance so that um, startle response or being on guard or being on the lookout for racism, right? So hopelessness, helplessness, depression, and anxiety. So these are all symptoms that can result from um, recurrent experiences with direct racial stressors. So those are things like uh, interpersonal interactions that you have with people. So being followed around a store, for example, Dr. Turner just talked quite a bit about vicarious stressors, right? So how are we witnessing or seeing these stressors carried out on the media in social media, um, especially right now, I think um, we're getting a lot more vicarious exposure to these racial stressors. And I think that as we're understanding what racial trauma looks like in terms of behavioral outcomes, right? So if I am feeling angry and I am responding in a way behaviorally um, that may or may not be adaptive, then we can start to think about, okay, how do I know that I need to seek help? When can I access this help or is this help accessible? And what other resources do I have within myself, within my family and with my, within my community to help me heal with or heal from and overcome these racial stressors. Um, so when we talk about racial trauma, I always say, yes, we're gonna emphasize, right, the stressors that we experience, yes, we're gonna emphasize those maladaptive outcomes, but I also want to really emphasize our family's ability, our community abilities to help us heal with and cope from these experiences. Because like Dr. Turner and Dr. Jernigan have talked about, access to those services that already exist is limited. And when we are engaging in those services, what we, we find from Black clients is that either we're not feeling our, our experiences validated by our clinicians um, or right that these services are not ones that are easy to access. So my recent research is looking at access barriers. So clients are saying things like, yes, I'm engaged and I want to receive these services, but you only offer them between nine and five. So are you offering evening hours or weekend hours even or childcare for my other children while I'm receiving services from you? Um, so in thinking about how we can increase access to those services, I think it's also important to consider what individual strengths do these clients or these families already have and what familial strengths do they have and how can we integrate their community into their coping mechanisms and coping responses. Um, so that's not to right, diminish the impact of racial stressors or to diminish the, um, I think, ongoing need that we have to provide mental health care that is efficacious and that is um, specifically targeting these racial stressors. But it's also right to empower ourselves as communities and as individuals and as families um, to really overcome them as well. Okay, and I wanna, and I wanna just, wanna just take, a take a moment to, a moment to remind, remind I'm sorry, I'm I get sorry, a little bit of echo. Uh, I just want to take a moment to remind the audience to please, uh, if you have questions, comments, please put them in the chat and we'll uh, envelop them in, into the conversation. Um, Dr. Metzger, I love, the, the, I love that you brought up the notion of strengths base, right? Of looking at sort of how we have been strong and resilient, what sort of resources we have that may not look like traditional therapy uh, coming from our family and our communities and our institutions. Um, as, as we sort of explore that a little bit, talk a little bit about, and I'll sort of open this up, about healing and coping uh, with racial trauma and the you know the variety of things that that we've listed so far. So I guess briefly, I can talk about um, racial socialization as kind of the overall construct or the overall process that Black families are engaging in to have that conversation about race. Um, and I said conversation, and I want to backtrack immediately and say it's not only a conversation, right? So it's a series of practices and of processes that Black families are going through. Um, so these are things like going to Black history museums or reading books around our hidden figures or prominent Black um, figures who might otherwise not be mentioned in our news and in our education. 
Um, so black families are saying, yes, there are kids are reading American history books and they're learning about slavery from that regard. But I'm also supplementing that with black history at home. And we're going through and, lead, and learning about our leaders and how we're able to overcome these stressors um, that I think some uh, education and certainly the media um, could take an approach that is more deficit based when it comes to African-Americans. Um, so racial socialization, I think, is that process, again, that allows us to build up our pride that allows us to make up for a lack of representation or negative representation through racial pride messaging, but also prepares us concretely for those experiences with barriers that we're going to face or those stressors that we're going to face. So parents will say they're having conversations about, okay, what do you do if you get pulled over by the police? What do you do if you get followed around a store? Not only how do you respond, but how do you cope with them in the moment? How do you go back to your community and instill pride or, or say, okay, I got followed around a store today. I'm gonna start shopping at black owned stores or with black owned uh, or with black merchants, right? So how are we responding behaviorally in ways that are more adaptive um, and proactive, right? So that can lead to the change that we'll like to see. Um, I think that in boosting our pride and in coming up with concrete strategies and not only coming up with them, but passing on the ones that we know traditionally work, right? So we heal by protesting. We heal by calling our senators, for example. We heal by getting off of social media, unplugging and talking to like-minded people, right? So the revolution will not be televised, right? So that is from the civil rights mo movement. But we know that today, what that means is that, right, we're not going on these discussion groups online, what we're doing is using our hashtags and talking to like-minded people as opposed to arguing and, and, and um, reaching perhaps other racial stressors, right? So we can think about um, our family's ability to pass on these messages and these values um, that allow us to heal from and to, to use our community and to use our own individual and collective strengths intergenerationally. Perfect. I want to. I want to um, jump in quickly just to sort of add to that, um, and also um, mention our uh, collaboration that uh, Dr. Mesker and Dr. Mario and I um, co-authored a, a chapter related to this topic area. Really understanding how social media and, and events like this are really helpful as part of our healing. And so I think when people can listen to podcasts around mental health, there are a lot of therapists and clinicians of color who have podcasts to talk about, you know, approaches to address your mental health or cope with stress or cope, or cope with racism. Those are really helpful resources and tools that we can use to be able to sort of heal as well. I would say um, uh, the other important piece about uh, social media, right, is, is this is another level of accessibility for information. Um, as Dr. Metzger, you know, pointed out, the, the notion, the, what we call the sort of the idea of racial trauma has existed for some time. I am, you know, in 2020, 2021, um, it's still noteworthy to me when I do or we do community-based events, how many um, Black folks are still taking in and understanding the impact of experiences of racism and racial discrimination. I always say that we um, live through, attempt to survive through racism, but have rarely been afforded the validation as well as the opportunity to understand its impact. So I think for the black community as well, this is new language, um, new information that's really allowing for awareness that can then fuel some of the strategies that Dr. Um, Metzger uh, pointed out. And so uh, to, to Dr. Turner's point, um, for individuals that are offering, you know, webinars, podcasts, et cetera, I am finding, you know, really positive response to, you know, folks just saying, I didn't know that that's what was happening to me, right? I certainly knew I was having a response to whether, my, you know, watching something on the news or something that I experienced directly, but I, I wasn't as aware, right, of the impact. So I always, you know, talk about the fact that coping is, is important, um, but coping is not healing. And so some of the other longer term strategies, thinking about, you know, the community, thinking about the intergenerational piece, what makes racial trauma unique uh, from a trauma-informed perspective, right, is that it is cumulative. It starts early in the lives of individuals. It, you know, it can happen across the lifespan directly uh, as well as vicariously. Um, and it's, and, you know, intergenerational, right? So it's both my stories and the stories that I heard from my mother, the stories that I heard, you know, from my grandfather, right? So we also carry those narratives and experiences that serve to inform how we interact right, in the, in, in the community or just exist in the world. And so as we make folks more aware and teach you know, skills 
um, ideally those get passed on, right, to future generations as well, to communities. And it's a collective experience that really helps to facilitate um, necessary, you know, collective healing because we know that systems of social support really serve to promote and predict overall yeah. emotional well-being. I recently, I was going to say, so I recently started um, thinking about social media as a public health approach to spreading awareness and to doing prevention and even um, well, we always have to do those caveats, right? So this is not this is not a clinical service or this is not therapy that I'm providing, but certainly it's a form of of care that we're able or service that we're able to provide in terms of um, delivering and spreading awareness around evidence based coping strategies. So what do we know based on the literature, based on research? works and how can we make those strategies available to the public? I think social media is a great way to do that. Um, and also through our research, right, what we're seeing is that if we're able to utilize these very same constructs, these very same strengths, these very same family practices in mental health treatment, then we're able to see people who, one, weren't able to access the services, start to access them, people who were initiating services, but then withdrawing from services, right, or ending their treatment early, we're able to see them stay engaged in services because like Dr. Jarnigan just mentioned, once we start talking about our experiences with racial stressors, once we start providing psychoeducation around racism, around discrimination, around post-traumatic slave syndrome, around race-based traumatic stress, right, around racial trauma, we start to see light bulbs go off in our clients' heads and they're saying, wait, these are my experiences. Whether or not I came in for any other, right, sort of interpersonal stressor, what I do know is that these experiences are very real and very pervasive as well. And we are seeing that even when white clinicians are able to have these conversations and really validate the experiences of black clients, then the black clients are also utilizing those coping strategies. So whereas before they would say mindfulness, like what? But if we talk about culture and where do you would draw your strengths from and they talk about spirituality, we can say, oh, OK, mindfulness is just like giving thanks. Right. So being aware of counting your blessings. Right. We're able to say, oh, meditation. Just think of it as prayer. Right. So we're able to make the work that we're doing more valuable and more relevant and more engaging for our clients. Right. And as Dr. Jarnigan just talked about, so we're not going to say, OK, you need to engage in behavioral activation. We're going to say, OK, what sorts of things can you do within your community to respond to this very real stressor? Right. What sorts of things do you feel agency over that you can impact some sort of change? And then we are able to see right that their outcomes like hopelessness, helplessness, depression, anxiety, these very general outcomes we can start to see are improved just by treating or just by healing from these racial stressors as well. There are so many things I want to follow up on. That was, I mean, that was beautiful. Uh, I, I, you know, there's, there's a question in the chat on, on culture, and I'm going to ask that question specifically. Um, but the interlude that I, that I'm thinking is, uh, you know, this idea of, of not of connecting with sort of our sheroes and our heroes in the culture in America is sort of an aspect of this cultural healing. Um, but then there is something to be said about the sheroes and heroes and the practices and beliefs of our people before America, right? And, and going all the way, all the way back to our, our, our ancient roots. Um, how often do you see those kinds of things coming into this conversation? And and given that our at least our American way of thinking about mental health diagnosis and disorder and DSM and all of that, you know, it doesn't even touch that at all. How do you connect those kinds of things for folks? I would say, you know, and this is where it becomes for me really important um, for individuals that are interested and, in, you know, seeking services to also see as their right to ask questions. So certainly amongst, you know, my colleagues and folks who are truly trained and understand, um, you know, race related stress, um, as well as trauma, um, there is, you know, certainly the aspect of thinking about individual services, but we understand that racism doesn't just happen to individuals, right? It happens to you know, families and communities. And so oftentimes for myself and um, certainly in my conversations um, with Dr. Metzger and even Dr. Turner when we talk about families, it is about connecting individuals back to 
already existing, right? Communities, resources, really validating some of what we may not recognize, right? As, uh, as Black people, as being really strengths and resources with regard to promoting our coping and healing. So translating, as you said, some of what Budic space, you know, in the United States, um, and in terms of some of the training as well, may not have the same language. And so I, I do think as the conversation continues to um, increase in the field of mental health for folks who have been thinking about and doing this work for some time, it is about um, connecting to and identifying resources because we know that thinking about an individual or kind of singular experience with regard to a therapist is limited, that people go off, right, and live their lives amongst their families and within their communities. So they, and they're having experiences in those spaces. So we need to be able to connect them to, um, you know, whether they are community-based racial healing circles to recognize that therapists the only one that may hold right all of the answers and resources with regard to coping and healing and and tapping into i mean part of that promotion and racial socialization is providing some psychoeducation and history and connecting folks to their roots so to speak uh, which helps them to identify and really draw on in positive and proactive ways right the strengths of she rose the resistance for me, um, that our ancestors um, have had, you know, given that racial oppression is not something that's new. Yeah, just to add to that quickly, I think, you know, one point that you mentioned is about drawing on the strength of our ancestors. And I think for me, as I was given a, a talk on Tuesday, the, the day of George Floyd's um, death a year ago, was really thinking about in my own work in terms of doing advocacy and, and having these types of events to talk about that is that sometimes I'm not feeling like I do have that strength to, to go through and like do another talk about race. Um, but then thinking about what have been the, the struggles and things that our ancestors have sort of overcome and continue to fight for. And so that gives me a, at least a little bit of a, a nudge to be able to sort of continue this, this work that we are doing and to also make sure that I do take care of myself. And, and as uh, Dr. Mary mentioned, you know, engage in some rest uh, which is also needed to be able to sort of maintain your yeah. mental health. Absolutely. Can we talk about rest as a recovery right. and as a radical act of resistance? Radical. Absolutely. I'm part of the NAP ministry. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly, um, I think that, especially for us as Black folks, right? Like we work twice as hard. We know we got to work twice as hard to get half as far. Um, I think that as much as we're able to radically accept the need to rest twice as much, to recover and restore twice as much, the more I'm so glad to hear you say that, Dr. Turner, the more we can continue to do this work because otherwise, right, we're doing the work and we're battered and we're beaten and we're tired, right? And then we get burnt out. And I think that as much as we're able to, to radically plan for time and you guys are all my colleagues as well as friends. So you know that we do make sure that we ask each other, right? So, okay, great deadline that we just met. What are we doing to rest? What are we doing to at least carve out some time? Because we know that if we don't protect that time, right, that, that likely we're not going to take it. Um, so certainly in terms of overcoming racial stressors, I think it's so important to just do those self checks and to ask ourselves, so how am I today? Do I need to rest? How am I after this conversation? Right, because we do know that even if right joy comes from within, so I'm going to be good across the board. But there might be times during the day that I have to go ahead and plan and say, you know what, this is going to be a tough one. I'm going to be in a room full of X, Y, and Z, and they might not think the same as me. So maybe I'm going to block off 20 minutes after that to help mm -hmm. me recover. Or right, so I know that George Floyd's anniversary is this week. Right. I'm going to make sure that maybe I'm going to take the week off of Instagram. Maybe I'm going to plan to see my nephew, which I'm doing, right? So making sure that we are building in those, again, familial, those community-based approaches to allowing us to recover and really take that time to rest and unplug. Yeah, the recovery is about, right, countering the impact and effect of, right, the racism, which is oppressive, right? We've talked about all the many ways that it, which impacts us. So I think even, I agree with, with Dr. Turner, one of my things is seek radical joy on a daily mm -hmm. basis, like radically seek joy, right? So the, the idea of joy amidst oppression, right, is resistance, yes. right? Racial oppression serves, right? And it's to the detriment of, of uh, black folks. And so when we dare to be joyful, to be intentional about being joyful, that also is an act of, of resistance, but we, we do 
you need to be intentional. Can you stop at the end of your day, both plan for joy, but also stop at the end of your day and say, what's one thing, right, that brought me joy today? And how can I think about what I'm, what it is that I'm going to do tomorrow? That counters some of the impact that we're talking about from a mental health and quite frankly, a physical health perspective. Come on. So I, I and I want to throw this in again because I feel like we're touching on something that's so necessary in that. Right. So racial stressors, racism, it makes us it by nature. Right. Is to distract, is to destroy, is to deteriorate. And I think that as much as even in day to day instances. So we talk about progressive muscle relaxation as a coping strategy. What is that? So that is to say, black folk, you might be gritting your teeth in these meetings and not even realize it. So can you take some time to tense and relax your muscles so that you can restore, so that you can cope, so that now we're gonna take it a step further from tensing and relaxing, we're gonna smile in the face of racism. So we're gonna be in that meeting and we're gonna be upset and maybe we can practice that PMR in the moment and not just grit our teeth, but respond in a way that again, calls us and reminds us of, of our internal state, which is joy, right? So I'm not gonna let that microaggression or that micro invalidation or that micro assault, or you saying I'm well-spoken or I speak well for a black person or how did I get this job or end up in this class, right? So our response is this, we talk to our clients, right? About opposite action. So this is what you're feeling. You already know that's not the truth. Challenge that in your mind, go ahead and give it back. What did you mean by that? With a smile, right? So that's a very act. And I love all the smiles that I'm seeing right here, right? Because <laughs> we do that. <laughs> Right. When we are seething inside, you just smile. What do you mean by that? And you give it right back to them. You go home and you stew on that and you you realize that what you just said was problematic and why. But I'm going to leave. Right. So that's unplugging. That's distancing. That's right. Picking your battles and knowing how to respond mm -hmm. in the moment um, in a way that I think, right, calls back to our innate and our um, kind of baselines, which for us, right, that's going to be joy. Right. Wow. I was I was I was thinking about you know, there's this aspect of mental acrobatics that you do mm -hmm. of, you know, prepping mm -hmm. yourself to go into a situation, mm -hmm. grinning, you know, trying to grin through the situation and then planning for recovery after the situation. And after you go through all of that, you know, this notion of self-care is, you know, it, it is it's critically important. It's vital because after going through a day like that, if you don't be intentional about that, then it will wear on you in ways that you can't even account for and sneak up on you. Um, someone mentioned in the comments about uh, cultural memories and kind of thinking about cultural memories and how it relates to racial trauma. I think Dr. Miriam sort of, uh, or, or Dr. Miriam and Dr. Mesker both brought up notions of intergenerational trauma, kind of what we learn from our grandparents and so on and so forth. But tell us a little bit about cultural mm -hmm. memories and how that relates to r racial trauma. I'll tell you a story, uh, a mm -hmm. personal story, which I rarely do to demonstrate this. So last summer, um, I was able to visit my parents who lived, you know, during uh, you know Jim Crow through the Civil Rights Movement, and my mother, who has never really in, in the South, um, and my mother, who's never really explicitly talked about. I mean, they were very proactive in terms of our racial socialization, but literally just sort of spontaneously started telling me stories about. Growing up in neighborhoods um, which you know were threatened uh, by racial terrorism, with regard to you know the Ku Klux Klan, for example, coming through and how the men in the community would would lie awake at night outside, hiding in ditches, et cetera, in an effort to protect the community. And I'm listening to her, you know, being patient and listening. And so as she starts talking, my father chimes in, and he's a Vietnam veteran, and he's talking about his experiences coming back from Vietnam as a black veteran, and you know, in the midst of the '60s, and you know, and, and navigating the racial tensions here, and what it meant to be spit on, you know, as a, as a veteran. Mm -hmm. And they both mm -hmm. connected those memories and those experiences um, to being triggered by watching the protests on the news currently. Right. So something in the present for themselves. These are their direct experiences. Right. My father talked about the fact that he was no longer sleeping well. And at first he couldn't, you know, he didn't really understand it. Right. And he realized like, oh, right. What is going on in the country in the summer of 2020 is reminding me of very painful, very real experiences for both of them. So as we think about, as I said, it is both for them, right, their direct experiences, their memories that may be triggered in the future. So when I say what's unique about racial trauma is that it's not a singular event. 
mm -hmm. you know, for folks um, that it often right multiple events across one's lifespan. And we know that, you know, the, the, when one experiences right sort of uh, traumatic stress, right, has a traumatic stress response, which can result in, um, um, in trauma um, that certainly right can be triggered and future interactions, et cetera. So as we think about black um, individuals, as I said, the research with regard to youth indicates that youth as young as the age of two um, experience racism and by the age of five, they can you know, clearly articulate uh, experiences of racial discrimination, harassment, et cetera, which a lot of folks don't like to believe, but is accurate if you sit down and talk to young people. That's two and five, early in one's life, right? And continues, we said, you know, across your life in schools, across your life with regard to thinking about you know, professional work. Um, so as we think about, again, memories, think about the people that watched the video, right, of George Floyd. And I heard so many individuals talking about their own encounters with police, right? So again, the, the events that we witness sometimes will trigger our own experiences. And there's emotion, there's a response attached to that in the ways that my mother, right, and my father began to talk about, you know, uh, their experiences then, but what they were then experiencing in 2020, right, some decades later so as we think about um racial trauma um and both the, the coping and healing um it requires that we take into consideration right the range of experiences across generations as well as across one's lifetime recognizing that future situations um can can trigger memories from the past for folks and serve to exacerbate right some of the the, the impact that we see I want to jump in quickly, and I know we have a lot of more things to touch on, but um, your story reminded me of just sort of the research looking at the impact of witnessing um, police brutality and how when white people witness those events that they're less likely to report increased poor mental health or, or, or stressors as a result of that. Whereas for Black people, we tend to experience some of those things. And so there was a national study that was published up maybe like three or four years ago that really looked at what are the differences in terms of white individuals and black people in terms of these national events of police brutality occurring. And what that study found was that white people pretty much reported no increased stressors as a result of witnessing those events. Whereas black people, regardless of where you lived, that you were more likely to report, you know, some of those incidents in terms of anxiety, stress, even symptoms of PTSD. And so I think that also speaks to the points that you were making, as well as the, the comment, the question related to sort of how does those culture experiences relate to racial trauma? That's the connection, right, that we feel to other, you know, recognizing the history and to other folks that we identify with. In other words, other Black people, right? So, you know, recognizing, as we heard, right, folks say, George Floyd could have been my brother, my uncle, my father, right? It's the, the connection. And, and I, too, have looked at some of the, the research related to white identifying folks that there's a disconnect. Right, it's the, you know, the witnessing doesn't have the same impact because the relatability, right? The ability to empathize, and, and that's a whole other conversation in podcast, but the ability to empathize with regard to the experience, right, of, of black folks. Um, it may not be, right, as present, that's part of the work that they need to do in their own identity development. Mm. I was having, as you guys were talking, I was having memories of I feel like every time the news breaks of another black murder by police brutality, right? We we say say their names and we start to realize, right? Like, okay, George Floyd was exactly like Alton Sterling, was exactly like Philando Castile, was exactly like Rodney King, right? So we can go back as far as we need to go. And those are the memories that not only are we intentional about um, kind of evoking to, um, recall and to remember their legacy, but also, right, it is an addition to the trauma. It is further solidifying. It is further reminding us that, good God, if it was happening with Rodney King and it's happening with George Floyd, then yes, it could be my brother, right? So that is the way that the connection is made over time. That is the way that I think the um, kind of the, the memories um, are, are used to help us realize that, yes, we've healed from it before. We can continue to heal from it. We can continue to do this work, but that this is a pervasive and ongoing and a systemic problem that um, hopefully we can help work together to help eradicate and to help um, kind of dismantle and restructure those systems that allow those kind of common occurrences and, and familiar occurrences to continue.
Yeah, as you were talking, Dr. Metzger, I, the name that immediately came to mind, I'll, I'll encourage folks to just think about, this is racial socialization, right? The ways in which we learn about, you know, historical events. So I was thinking Emmett Till specifically, right? I'm, Who I'm, was it that I learned about Emmett Till? But it was a name that I knew, and it was a story that, that was important in some way, right? That was communicated in my community and in my family, right? That continues. So even as we go way back, right, what are some of these sort of larger, right, events that that sort of stand the test of time, right, with regard to history that serve as uh, reminders um, that families and communities continue to, right, right. as we, say, we continue to see in real time, in essence. We have about um, eight minutes or so left. Um, one thing that I want to make sure, and I and I also want to encourage the uh, those who are listening to go ahead and type, you know, Put your questions in the chat so we can have those. But while they're doing that, there's a an African tribal saying, the Maasai people that would say, "How are the children?" Mm. and and it's used as a greeting, but it's it sort of communicates as the strength of the children are, so goes the 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 tribe and the community. So I want to pose that question to to you all today: How are the children? The children are struggling. I'll let Dr. Earl go first. Oh, <laughs> well, I'll go last. I was about to say, I'll go last. Yeah. Are, the, are we the children? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think definitely, um, like children are having difficulties right now, mm -hmm. and I think it, it's partly because of just the context and the environment that mm -hmm. they're in. And as Dr. Miriam talked about before, you know, kids recognize racism and, and they witness these things at a very young age. And unfortunately, sometimes we feel like those conversations don't need to be had with children. We, we give them some like tools and ideas about like things that you should and should not do, but we don't really talk about what's the reasoning behind why you're doing those types of things. And so I think that you do want to have like, again, tying it back to that socialization piece that you want to have that conversation with kids about why you're doing this, like what's the reason behind it, and that you also want to be able to make sure that you model for kids like how to handle some of those situations and how to like cope. And, and part of that, you know, for me, I oftentimes um, I tell parents that you have to show kids how to do things. Like oftentimes, as adults, we want to tell them like you should do this, but we're doing the opposite thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw I saw really um, I saw interesting video on social media recently where the person was like, we tell kids to like be calm, but then we're in the grocery store like raising our voice and yelling at someone. Well, maybe you should sort of think about in that in that moment, like how are you demonstrating for your child to navigate these different experiences that they're gonna um, have in life? And so I think that is going to be helpful and important for us to do as adults and as parents. Yeah, just to go back to, you know, as I said, just um, when I said the kids are struggling, I mean, certainly they are surviving to and attempting to resist. But I do think um, as we look at, you know, some of the studies that are beginning to pay attention to, right, the state of Black mental health and overall health in the Black community, it does concern me, right, that our youth are, you know, um, engaging um, in thoughts um, as well as, you um, you, you, thinking about specifically the, the 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 data that I provided with regard to suicidality, um, both suicide thoughts of suicide, but also suicide completion, and the you know over a hundred percent increase, and the research that's beginning to to really understand that, talk, you know, stating that for many youth, as we begin to understand that, there's a correlation to youth's experiences of racial discrimination. And so, how are we preparing? To Dr. Earl's point, to Dr. You know Metzger's point, how are we preparing our youth? And what? And I say that specifically because some of my research that I had done. Some, some years ago really looked at how youth were understanding race, racism, racial discrimination. And as a result of the post-civil rights movement, I think it's important to note that many folks were hopeful, right? That the ways in which race manifested previously, right, would not be the case. And so for some parents who I also interviewed, they weren't having explicit conversations, right? Um, they were dealing with their own racial pain and, and, and memories as well, but they weren't having and preparing and offering narratives um, to, to Black youth about the importance of being able to remain aware and to recognize experiences of racial discrimination in overt as well as more you know, subtle daily ways. And what that ended up doing for many youth that I worked with was they were both not having conversations, so silence, right? Explicit conversation in all ways. Their schools were, were 
not providing an accurate portrayal of history, right? And telling them, not validating their experiences or the context that they're in, right? We're saying, you know, racism, right, isn't a thing. And then they were having these lived experiences which were very different. And so I often met with youth that would say it was confusing, it was anxiety provoking. And I think some of what we're seeing as we see race relations, right, could, um, continue to be in this place that feels very divisive in the United States. Um, we also need to go back and think about what are the ways in which we're socializing, preparing our youth, our communities, our families um, with regard to the realities, not the myths that folks will tell us about, you know, our experiences. Um, and un unapologetically allowing us to validate our own experiences so that we can you know, really uh, continue to resist. But I am concerned um, when looking at some of the mental health data for the youth. Dr. Well, Metro, gonna... did you have any final thoughts? Yeah, so I'll say um, to echo and mirror all of the sentiments that were um, previously stated. So um, I'll also add to that, that the children are outside right? The children are on social media. The children are angry. The children are creatives, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about one youth in particular who um, came to one of my, so I have passion, power, um, purpose sessions, and I was meeting with a very angry uh, member of our community who um, is a teenager, mm -hmm who was talking about, this was after, um, I think it was between <laughs> Armand Arbery and Breonna Taylor, um, right after John Lewis passed, this team was very angry and discouraged and saying, right, like, why are we doing this work and, and why is it taking so long to make progress? Um, but this team also, like I said, was online and what this team did was, um, they built a bot to spam Daniel Cameron's, they started to try to spam his house. And I said, don't do that, right? Spam the district attorney's office. <laughs> so we got Daniel Cameron, that's the district attorney um, who was taking way too long to arrest the murders of Breonna Taylor. So in this instance, there was a team who built a bot to spam the district, well, I convinced him to do it at the district attorney's office, right? But to make those phone calls to create those messages, to pass them on to your friends that they can utilize as a template, as a way to ask for anything that you wanna see, as a way to put, I'm gonna say petition, right? To petition for any change that you want to see, as a way to start in a peaceful protest or a rally in your community. So when I say that the kids are angry and they're outside and they're online, that to me says for us as researchers, as practitioners, as educators, as adults in our community to go online, to go outside, to go where the kids are and to reach them with the messaging, the coping strategies, whatever it is that our lane or our skill set or our evidence base is to utilize what we know and to meet them where they are so that we can encourage them to use the opposite actions for those very real and very relevant and very normal responses to these racial stressors that they're experiencing. So how do we meet them and say, oh, I recognize and I realize that you're angry and me too. So what can we do about that? And how can we empower these teens? So yeah, they might be struggling. Yeah, I would I would um, say that they're they're out there. They're doing the work in the best way that they know how. And that as much as we're able to come together to do that work with them, to talk to their parents, to talk to their friends, to get into their communities, the more we're able to see that as a community, as a collective, we're able to, in this generation and in future generations, like Dr. Jernigan said, not just cope with, but really start to heal from these racial stressors. Yeah, so it sounds like they're ready, the, the youth are ready and willing to resist, but they may need, right, our assistance and guidance is what I hear our engagement this is this has been such such a delight um i i one thing i just want to say that this there is a sense of love that is coming from this conversation and that re reverberates throughout our community that that there's this love of protecting each other, of keeping each other, of holding each other up in whatever capacity, whether you are a preacher, a psychologist, a mom, you know, whatever capacity you're in, the sense of love. Uh, and, you know, if I could be so bold as to say a Zola 
uh, Azola African strength based love. So Dr. Turner, thank you so much for convening this conversation. We, um, we will follow up with the questions that we have, but we've talked about a lot today, a lot to process, to think, to hold on to, and to take back to our communities and our families to continue the conversation outside of this one hour space. So thank you all so much. Dr. Turner, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I am just so grateful for all of you taking the time today to, to do this and have this conversation. Uh, piggybacking off of what you mentioned, Dr. Barnett, um, I'm excited because I just published an article in the Journal of Black Psychology with some colleagues looking at the Black model, which is Black love, activism, um, and community model, uh, which really talks about that love that we have and, and when we're, we're trying to engage in healing, but also doing this work, um, that it's, it's because we love each other and we love our communities. And, and that's really at the heart of at least the work that I do. And I think, you know, for many of us um, that are having these types of conversations. So um, I appreciate everyone for joining us today. Um, please follow the panelists. Uh, I posted their information for their social media in the um, comment boxes. So do connect with them. They share a lot of great, excellent resources around mental health, around racial trauma. Um, and so, you know, check out their platforms and um, stay tuned for more events from Therapy for Black Kids. Take care, everyone.